Welcome everybody to the Arlington Finance Committee officially opening the meeting. As a preliminary matter, this is Alan Tosti, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticip uh, anticipated on the agenda and present are here. Members, I'll go through the agenda one more time. Grant Gibeon. Here. Shane Bondell. Here. John Ellis. John Ellis. Here. Carolyn White. Carolyn. She's muted. <laughs> Here. Sorry, I wasn't near the screen. Mary Margaret Franklemont. Mary Margaret, you're mute. Mary yeah. Margaret. Am I here? You're here. <laughs> Arif Padaria. I'm here. Jonathan Wallach. Here. Charlie Foskett. Here. Brian Beck. Peter Howard. Here. Shailene uh, Pocress. Here. Daryl Harmer. Here. John Dice. Here. Alan Jones. Here. Annie LaCourt. Here. Bill Keller. Bill. Bill, say here. Sorry, I'm here. I, I had to unmute. I apologize. Okay, no problem. Al Tosti, I'm here. George Koser. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. Dave McKenna. Here. Our Executive Secretary, Liz Diggins. Here. Okay. Um, anticipated speakers, Kathleen Bodie. Here. Michael Mason. Here. Adam Chapelain. Here. Uh, introduction to remote meeting. Good evening. This open meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency at the Commonwealth, due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a public accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to remote, participate remotely. The order which you have uh, find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of this meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting of the Finance Committee is convening via Zoom as posted on the town website, ident identifying how the public may join. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting materials, all supporting materials that are provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Ground rules. We are now to, uh, turning to the first item of the agenda, which by chance is the only item on the agenda. Before I do so, please permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker, speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will call for questions or comments. Please raise your hand or push the clap button to be recognized. If you want to add uh, to, add, uh, to an issue under discussion, <coughs> please push the thumbs up button. When these are finished, I will call for a motion and second it. Further discussion will then be allowed, followed by a roll call, which is legally required. So Annie, can you do what you did last time and tell me who's the next on the list? Yes, I can do that. Okay. Um, further, remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a, in a colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Okay, so uh, with that, the 
primary focus is on the Appendix E, uh, which you all should have. I sent it out on Friday. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> good sorry. Uh, this will be an appendix right in the Finance Committee report, uh, which we hope to get out tomorrow. Uh, go, just to give you an overview, uh, going into uh, the Long Range Planning Committee meeting in May, uh, I guess I uh, put forth the thought that we need to start making some cuts now. Even if we don't know what the cuts are going to be down the road, we need to start doing some of those cuts now. So I recommended to the uh, Long Range Planning Committee that we start with 10% of the increase. Uh, so uh, everybody, in, uh, plus some cuts in the Warren articles and elsewhere. So the Long Range Planning Committee agreed with that. Uh, the manager has uh, moved on with his cuts, which you see in Appendix E. The school department uh, the superintendent has put forth her cuts, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, the Warren articles, uh, I'll go into in more detail when I get there, and then some use of reserves. Uh, this total changes um, of about 3,200,000. Uh, now we put this together with a 15, an estimated 15% 15 reduction in local aid from the governor's January proposal. Uh, and that um, thus with the 15% reduction, all these, we have a uh, balanced budget going forward, uh, going on the basis that we don't know what the final cuts are gonna be. Um, and this is uh, uh, based on the uh, manager's best estimate or guess uh, from his uh, uh, conversations, I would say, with state leaders. Um, but at this point, it's, it's a best estimate. So uh, it, it will put off the deficit until fiscal 2024, um, which was what we had projected from the overrides and from our last, uh, we were moving towards. But the deficits are too, too big. So we're gonna have to do, be doing, we might have to be doing some more down the road but at least this is a start. Uh, so with that, um, the manager can go through his reductions, which amounted to about 20% uh, of uh, his total increase. So uh, Adam, could you go through your area? Yes, thank you, Al. And uh, good, e good evening, members of the committee. Uh, Al, do you, do you want me to talk at all more contextually or, or framework or just hit those positions and then, and then take it from there? Um, if you'd like to add some things to the general framework, that'd be fine, and then hit the, uh, these positions. Okay, thank you. So I, I think just to, to add a little bit about state aid, which is really the biggest variable in what we're facing, um, I, I think you, you've probably all read some or all of the reports that have been out there of what the state has been facing. Uh, there's talk of the state next year in FY21 facing a revenue deficit anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of their annual revenue. Uh, they don't really know exactly what's going to happen yet, and they don't seem poised to adopt a budget, frankly, anytime soon. Uh, they might even adopt one twelfth state budgets uh, over the course of the summer in July and August. And I think the main reason that they're doing that is, well, two main reasons. One, they don't know what their revenues really are going to be. And two, there's significant hope that there will be some type of federal bailout for states uh, to help with state revenue losses. And until they know that, I think they're very hesitant to make cuts before they really know whether or not there's going to be federal assistance. And there's two possibilities for federal assistance. One, with the existing CARES Act, there was uh, $500 million earmarked for cities and towns. However, that $500 million has to be used for direct COVID-19 related expenses. Currently, in Arlington's case, uh, our allotment is far more than we can frankly envision spending on COVID responses. So there is a chance uh, through advocacy that the federal government will change what those funds can be used for. And that could be a source of funds that we use for potential state aid cuts. The other avenue is that there could be another stimulus bill with direct aid to states and potentially local governments. Uh, so th there's a lot more shoes to drop. I'm probably mixing metaphors there, but, um, but that, that's the landscape as I see it. 
state really doesn't know what its revenue is. It doesn't know whether or not it's going to get any help and isn't going to adopt a budget uh, necessarily anytime soon. From what I hear from legislative leaders, I, I've heard things ranging from chapter 70 won't be cut at all to expect a 25% state aid cut uh, and everything in between. So we, we, looked at, um, we looked at really anything and everything we could hear coming out of the state and decided collectively, myself, the deputy town manager, the finance team, working with the, long, uh, the revenue working group and the long range planning committee, that it was reasonable at this point to assume a 15% cut in state aid across the board. Whether it's that actual number, if it's the same percentage cut for chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid remains to be seen. Uh, but we felt like that was a safe estimate. Talking with a number of neighboring communities, it's in the ballpark of what um, many of our neighboring communities are looking at. Some have projected a little bit less of a cut, some a little bit more of a cut. Uh, so we are, we are matching up with what other communities are doing in that regard. Um, I guess I'd also like to mention there's, there's talk about one twelfth budgets. That's what the state might be doing. And the governor has taken action um, to allow us to adopt one twelfth budgets without town meeting action. And I, <clears throat> I've been an advocate for adopting a 12 year budget that we very, uh, 12 year, 12 month budget that we very well might have to come back and fix in the fall when, um, when we learn more. Um, but I'm, I'm advocating for that because I think it would be very, very hard specifically for the school department to build an operating budget on a 112th budget. 112th budget only allows you to really roll forward on a month by month basis your prior year's budget. So as the school department's trying to staff up now for next school year, uh, going forward on a 112th budget, um, I, I really think would be crippling for them. And I don't think that's what this town is, is looking for in terms of stability or what the, the override was put together for in terms of stability. So um, if ultimately we have to do a 112 budget, we will, but I don't think um, given the where we are in the long range plan, the amount of reserves we have, um, how we're able to maintain the override uh, staying in fiscal 24 with what we're presenting to you tonight, um, I think the path we're on, at least for now, is um, responsible uh, and potentially even in some areas conservative and leaves us room to fix things when we know more in the fall. Um, so with all that said, uh, when we were talking about reducing our increase by 10%, uh, myself, uh, the deputy town manager, talking with the FinCom chair, we all agreed that uh, adding any new positions in the town budget, given what we're facing, uh, wouldn't necessarily be prudent or responsible at this point, because uh, we could very well be in a position where we would be hiring people that we would soon after need to lay off. So we reduced our increase by greater than that 10% um, that Al was talking about. Uh, we actually eliminated every new position uh, that was um, proposed in the FY21 budget. Uh, if we were going with that 10% reduction in our increase, we would have only reduced our budget by just about $100,000. Instead, we proposed uh, about $260,000. So um, you, you see them in front of you, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention them quickly. We had proposed a new police officer that would have served as a second school resource officer. Um, I think we, we'd still like to do that someday, but given that we're not really even sure what school will look like in September, um, I, I don't think we are, we're really losing a level of service by not being able to add that right now. Uh, we had proposed two positions for public works a permit engineer and a systems innovation analyst. Uh, both of those are positions that I very much would have liked to have DPW have access to, but again, uh, given the circumstances we're facing, uh, no, no need to add them and then have to lose them very quickly thereafter. We had added um, hours to the, child, uh, the children's librarian at the Fox Library, um, but rather than removing those hours, the library director uh, suggested we remove a now vacant li part-time library clerk position as an alternative. And we, we, I'm fine with that recommendation. If she'd rather use her same allotment in a different direction, um, I'm fine with that. So that's why that position has been proposed to be eliminated in this budget. And then finally, we had proposed a part-time public records clerk uh, to work out of the town manager's office. And again, for the same reasons, we're eliminating that from our proposal. So that, uh, is my, my, my best attempt so far at um, a context of where we are and the uh, proposed changes that we're recommending for you tonight.
Okay. Uh, why don't we stop there? Are there any questions or comments on either the manager's overview or the manager's specific reductions? I have a question, John. Okay, John. John. Um, in the in the current situation, with uh, essentially no one in the schools and uh, remote uh, teaching and that sort of thing, um, uh, I certainly don't want to shortchange the schools in any way. But can there be any reductions in the uh, uh, in the um, funding for the schools uh, because of the situation. Okay, John, let me hold that for a minute and just stay with the town manager. We'll go on to the schools, the superintendent in a minute. Okay. Okay. Anything, uh, any questions for the manager? Yeah, it's Dean, I have a question. Dean? So Adam, you touched on um, how you formulated your expectation of state aid. But the other variable number in the budget is local receipts, which accounts for about, um, I think, close to $10 million in the current budget plan. Where, so I guess it's twofold. Where are we, how have we been performing on local receipts since March 1? And how is that factored into the current budget plan for 21? So local receipts, um, I don't want to say surprisingly, but... I'm, I'm glad to report that local receipts have been fairly steady since March 1. Uh, as of, I believe, the end of the first quarter, we had already surpassed our annual budget in collections for local receipts. So we were doing very well in terms of local receipts. Um, building permits seem to be flowing just, uh, just as freely as normal. We haven't yet seen any Im impact to motor vehicle excise. The only real material impact we've seen is to hotel, motel, and meals tax for obvious reasons. So. For this fiscal year, uh, local receipts are in good shape. Going forward, uh, on an annual basis over the past probably seven or eight years now, we have collected more uh, in local receipts than we've budgeted by a pretty significant amount. Uh, some years as much as $2 million more than we've budgeted, some years closer to a million. So what we're proposing in FY21 and beyond in this long range plan is instead of assuming that local receipts will go up by uh, just $100,000 a year, we're proposing to flatline that with no proposed increases. And given that we've been collecting for so many years more than we've been budgeting, and we do that to be conservative in our budget es estimates, we feel that just flatlining that number for the next several years will still keep us in a conservative position in what we'll actually collect in local receipts. Okay, quick, so second question. Um, is the current year budget in balance? It's the, it's a, it's a, is the current year budget in balance, if you include our finance committee reserve fund, yes. Okay. Well, and the, and the federal money for the COVID-19 that you Yes, got. yeah. So the townside budget's in balance. Okay. That's it, I think you went to the other questions. Thanks, Adam. Okay, Thanks. any other questions or comments on the manager? I have a question. Uh, That's Shailene Pokris. Oh, okay, hi, Shailene. Hi. A quick question, Bradham. Um, I realize we can't know exactly what will happen with the schools, if students will be in, in person or not. Can you just quickly address whether the, um, the school resource officer, I believe, was for the middle school, and it was a second officer? Uh, if the students are in person, how, does, how, will the, how will the Audison get along without the second officer? It, has that been, if that hasn't been discussed, then that's an answer. But um, I'm wondering if you could just quickly give us an idea of, like, what the plan is to have the lack of that position when it seemed like something that was needed. So I think, so to being honest, we haven't in detail discussed that with Chief Flaherty. Uh, I would imagine what will happen is that Officer White will continue to do uh, multi-effort, uh, you know, being in the high school and in other schools. And then I, I think the other thing we have to talk through with Chief Flaherty is Given our new circumstances, and I say that in the broadest means possible, um, may, maybe maybe she chooses to reassign another officer as a second SRO. I don't I don't want to commit her to that tonight, but I think I think those are the things we'll need to look at as we go forward. If if once we get into the new, po, you know, new COVID normal, um, you know, do, does she decide that she wants to dedicate an officer as a second SRO? Those those are things we can we can look at as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? 
Okay, uh, Dr. Bodhi, could you uh, go into your um, proposed reductions? Yes, uh, thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we were, I, I, I would like to give a loop, I would like to give a little context also um, for where this list comes from. Uh, if you recall, we had a five-year plan that we developed with the school committee and looking at what we anticipated with enrollment growth and other needs of the district, uh, what that would look like. The first year of that, which was this year, we did not actually um, have all of the requests. It was, it was a fairly large list, I have to admit. Some of that was moved into this list that you see right here. But I will tell you that the, 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 what was on the table for the administrative team to look at very closely was something about two and a half times this amount in terms of what uh, was, ex what was uh, determined to be needs of the district for enrollment growth and the support of students that um, are struggling with learning. So it took quite a bit of discussion to call the list to what we have right here. So this is a very thoughtful list. Um, and, you know, in anticipation of the, the situation we find ourselves in with the state, um, we, uh, we have taken a look at this and, and have identified a number, of, um, a number of positions that will just defer again uh, till the next fiscal year, if that's possible. I will, I will honestly tell you, though, that we probably are going to have to uh, adjust this a little bit. And the reason why is that um, one of the items that we had uh, identified were reserve teachers. These teachers have been put in the budget the, the last, um, I think the last decade actually. And they're put in there because we sometimes don't know what the enrollment is going to be uh, until we get into the summer. And that's exactly what's starting to happen as well. We're finding that we're probably going to need another um, teacher at one school for certain, two very likely, and three possibly. So, but what I, I will tell you is that whatever the percentage that, that is uh, determined this evening, the items that would be deducted from the school budget for next year or positions that would not be filled would be on this list. Uh, I can go through what we have identified at this point. In the, uh, the first category, which is all district, we've identified assistant principals. We have been, over the last year, trying to um, have a half-time assistant principal in our buildings as enrollment has grown. Uh, the, pretty much in many, in many districts, when you start getting to uh, uh, a, a building size of about 450, you're at that point you're starting to look at having an assistant principal in the building just because of all the work that's involved the supervision the um, evaluation system the meetings and so forth so we were able to partially do that um, the, what was in this was um, an assistant principal uh, two two additional ones and we have reduced that by one it's possible that in further discussions that will be uh, more than that we also have um, a sixth grade class that is moving into the seventh, which is larger than the seventh grade. And we had proposed having a half uh, learning community. So if those of you that have had children go through the, the middle school know that they used to, we call them clusters, where you'd have four of the core teachers having a group of students anywhere, that entire group is somewhere between uh, 100 and 120 students. It'll be at the upper end of that num that range if we do not have this position. Um, and as what we're seeing in the middle school is the beginning of these larger classes of 500 that are now starting to uh, be moving to Gibbs. Gibbs next year will probably be about 500 and the classes after that are over that. So um, going down the list here, um, we're, we're looking uh, at uh, additional um, teachers and support staff level, we have we don't usually identify what those positions exactly are. It's based on the schedule. 
So what happens in the high school is students choose which courses that they want to take. And we take a look at the, what those requests are. They don't necessarily always get the, what they want because uh, the schedule, it, the number of uh, teachers available to have the, all of the elective courses, have, or I should say more have multiple sections of some elective courses are not available. But uh, right now we believe that, the, that at least two of those positions will probably be in the English department uh, and the science department and physical education. Uh, we also, uh, given the number of students, um, going on here, let's see. As I said, we had the reserve positions and, and we're going to have to go back and modify this as if we need additional teachers, which it looks like we will. Um, the district has only had one physical therapist in as even as the whole, as the population has grown over these years. And then the caseload for that person has increased, but rather than um, choosing to get another physical therapist, uh, there is an, a, a new specialty, which is a physical, uh, which is a, uh, an assistant. And we are looking to hire a physical therapy assistant in the district for the caseloads, but we have to defer that a year, we will. Another position is the BCBA, which is a behavior specialist. Uh, we currently have two in the district who are, uh, are pulled in many directions all the time. And this was one of the uh, requests uh, for next year. Um, and that was actually a, a strong request by uh, teachers. Uh, some of these other positions really are, are other materials that are in this list are, are things that we, we must have. So they really were not uh, something that we were going to be able to, um, to reduce. So if we need another teacher, we'll go up and we'll have to reduce some of the other um, positions in this. So it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge with our growing enrollment. I know that this summer, uh, well, since um, we started registrations, we have an additional 50 students. This is not kindergarten, this is just across the district that have enrolled. Uh, I think that it's been fairly quiet over the last couple months, just probably due to the pandemic. Uh, so it's hard to predict, honestly, what will happen over the summer, but usually we have an uptick um, in kindergarten, but also across the whole district. But on the other hand, um, we agree uh, with the reality that the state is facing and the town is facing. And as a district, we also agree with um, uh, sticking with the, the, the propositions that in the override, which was we were going to push that out until 20. So that is, these are the positions we've identified at this point and, and happy to answer any questions. Okay, are there any... Uh... Charlie has his hand up, Al. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Charlie? Charlie. Thank you, Al. <clears throat> so, Kathy, thank you very much <clears throat> for that. And I realize that uh, these are certainly difficult times and you're making uh, a big effort there. <clears throat> I have two questions that are somewhat at a strategic level. Uh, first of all, do you recall or can you tell us um, that? The uh, October 19, October 2019, and um, estimated October 2021 enrollment school levels. How do they compare to the McKibben forecast back from you know, that we did in 2015? I think it was. Um, I this would be off my memory, but I will tell you that we looked at the last time this sometime this year. The, the total numbers are actually pretty good in comparing comparing to McKibben. But there have been surprises. Uh, and the surprises have been where the enrollment growth has been. It's the opposite of, of where um, we would, would have thought. So Pierce is, has been the biggest surprise of all. For many, many years, we've had two grades throughout the school. And now this is, I think, the, the will be coming up on the uh, third year, the fourth year, actually, uh, we have three classes per grade. So um, if we, 
we've looked at this very closely. This is a continuing trend. Will we be able to have three classes at Pierce? And the answer is yes, we've really figured it out how it can happen. Uh, but we really don't have a lot of space anywhere um, uh, right now in, in the schools. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. And Stratton also, um, Stratton's predictions with McKibben were to stay pretty steady at three three classes per grade and the last couple of years we've been at four. And, and that's one of the schools I'm seeing it's staying at four this coming year, which would mean an additional teacher. Well, thank you. I have a, a follow-up question to that, <clears throat> which is something that's been bothering me um, for the last month or so. And that is, uh, you know, there's apparently great um, lack of clarity at, at the, um, elementary and high school level as well as in some of the universities as to how students go back to full school in the fall. And um, it seems to me that um, in order to achieve the social distancing or whatever it is that the governor and the CDC is recommending, there will be a increased demand both for space and for human resources somehow. I mean, I don't know if it'll be increased or whatever, but I'm just wondering, has the school department developed a strategy to deal with um, those issues, that is um, social distancing space and human resources comes the fall? That's only two months away. It is two months away and there's still a lack of clarity as to exactly what we'll, what we'll be facing. We are in the process of developing three plans. One would be going back to school as we would normally do, but that still has to have a plan to it in terms of a lot of safety procedures in place. Um, having a totally remote environment, uh, and that also has issues with it as well. Um, it's, would be, it would be structured differently than we've been doing it this, this spring, which has uh, some pl planning that would have to go with it. I think the one that's is, is very challenging with the one you're sort of alluding to is the one that's been proposed as sort of a hybrid. And in, in that kind of situation, you would have half the school in part, part of the time and half the school out of the building. And there's different, I, different ways you can look at it, whether it's going to be um, every other week, I've heard proposals out in other communities of thinking about it being every two weeks. I've heard half days. And we actually have committees that are looking at these in terms of what would be um, the, the best situation. I, I think the half days it probably is not as likely only because of the, all of the safety uh, things we would have to put in place in terms of cleaning. Uh, so we are looking at that. I, I, I don't think we're going to have probably a decision or any guidance from uh, the governor or the Department of Education much before sometime in July. But it does make it challenging to, to plan sort of simultaneous um, pathways. But one thing I heard actually just today is we've been talking, there's been talking about besides the social distancing in the building, um, is it going to be necessary to take the temperature of every, of every child? There is some discussion that's out there right now um, in uh, health circles as to whether that is necessarily, uh, it would be a necessity to do, because um, that's actually been one of the, the, one of the challenging ideas is how you move uh, you know, hundreds of students into the buildings every day in any kind of, uh, uh, any kind of time frame that makes, makes sense. Um, even if you had half a building at the high school, we're talking about moving 750 students into the building with more limited access than we've had before too. So it's a, that part's a challenging, but that would actually be a very important step forward. Uh, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a lot of other protocols in terms of safety. Uh, some of it may have to be distancing. Um, and you know, one of, I think one of the other scenarios we have to be looking at here is that we might be able to start, or maybe we'll start in a hybrid situation, but how long will that last? Uh, we see what's happening in other countries right now, South Korea, where they, they opened the schools. They had a lot of protective gear. In fact, I saw a picture of one of the classroom the other day where they're having lunch and they had these plexiglass trifolds around every student. 
Um, but even with those kind of protections, they've had to close schools again. So if we have to go to some different type of, the, the, where, where I was going with this, I mean, if we have, if we have to go to alternate uh, weeks or something in order to accommodate our students in the space, are we gonna have to renegotiate uh, labor contracts and union contracts if we go on to some, um, let me call it, uh, unorthodox schedule? The answer is yes, um, but I will tell you that right now there's a, we have a very strong collaborative relationship um, with the unions. We've been working together um, all through this to figure out what makes the most sense and how can we do it with the best interest of children. You have to keep in mind that what we've asked teachers to do on literally no notice is to completely change how they, uh, they teach. Teaching over um, through a Zoom or a, a, our, Google, our Google platform is, is very different. And we're, we're, we're trying a lot of strategies right now. We have a couple of uh, study groups at the elementary and the secondary, maybe about 25 each of teachers who are experimenting with synchronous right now. And of course, there's a lot of challenges with it. One, I was just talking to one principal today about kindergarten next year, um, what that would look like. Because right now, when you get onto a, a Zoom, or a, I should just really say a Google Meet, because that's the platform we use, um, you, you need another person with a, even a small kindergarten class to be able to manage uh, them being on there. And, and their attention span is not that long. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges here. And so how do we, if we have to have a, more of a remote, how do we move forward? We've had to cull the curriculum these last couple of months in order to only teach the uh, uh, essential learning standards for students to be able to move to the next school year. But we certainly don't want to, that can't be the, the, the learning norm of next year. And so we have a lot of work to think about how we're going to do this. We're going to have committees working all summer on this. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. John uh, Dyke. Go ahead, John. Kathy, mm -hmm. what, are, what are you going to do if uh, things uh, stay as they are or get worse and you, there has to be isolation of uh, distance separation? Uh, a school could be a huge petri dish if it's uh, if it's not managed correctly. It seems like to me. So I'm wondering if you're thinking at all about the the worst possibility and 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 because the worst possibility is not unlikely in my opinion. Um, we are the worst being possibility meaning the students are out of school for months at a time. Right. right. Yeah. That's, that would be a pretty awful uh, consequence. Um, that, that we're definitely looking at that. And, and I think that the experience we've had this spring is going to really help in terms of trying to figure out how we're going to manage this. How do you schedule a day so that you can keep students' attentions, keep them engaged? Uh, you probably heard the expression flip classrooms. Uh, we're trying to do more of that where uh, students, um, you know, that the students do the work by themselves and then you use the opportunity when you're um, online with them to ask questions. It's not the most ideal and it, and it works, it doesn't work that badly at the high school or even the middle school level. It starts falling off as you get down to the lower grades. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a burden for parents because a lot of our, our K through two students, they need so much support from their parents uh, remotely to be able to manage it and manage it all and keep in mind some first graders aren't reading so we're depending upon them to read these these reading grids or these grids that we have for all of their assignments I, I have to compliment our teachers they've just done an enormously great job in organizing all of this work for students and it's consistent across the elementaries but it requires a lot of parental support and I think that that's going to be one of the big challenges of the fall is that as parents go back to work and maybe there's not childcare and, and how do, 
how do they manage working at home with children they're going to be more uh, using uh, remote learning more but that is exactly what we have to plan for is the worst possible situation and, and so that we can keep advancing the curriculum and, and keep students engaged I think one of the one of the challenges we've seen is that particularly at the a secondary level is that the students are, are can do the work on their own and if they don't have questions they don't join the hangout so it, that would have to shift next year because it it's it, it has this limitation in the amount of material the content that you can teach in a period of time uh, th these challenges are enormous <laughs> and uh, in, in terms of how you plan effectively um, one of the things that we've all I, I've said to people and it's true and it just even happened today you start thinking of one situation and then there's questions and questions and questions that follow in terms of what you have to plan for but we've already started organizing for that and planning ahead good thank you Okay, let me just uh, make one observation. Uh, Adam Chapelain uh, had to go to the selectmen's meeting, uh, but we have his replacement. Uh, Deputy Town Manager Sandy Pooler has just joined us. So, hi, Sandy. Um, okay, other questions for the superintendent? Jaylene has her hand up. Hello, I, I absolutely hear Dr. Bodie's statement that there are questions and questions and questions. So, I hesitate to add another question. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's a statement slash observation for the finance committee to just keep in mind and for, for the school committee to keep in mind. Um, as a parent of an, a middle schooler and a high schooler and a friend to many parents uh, with kids from K through 12, um, I know we're talking about budget reductions right now, but the one thing that I can see as a need coming, coming rapidly toward us, especially if, if students are uh, if students are working from home, which even if we go back to school in person, it seems very likely to me that we will need to continue the online component because we'll need to allow students to distance if they have any symptoms. And so we've already started to establish a way for students to work from, I'm just going to say work from home, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so my question observation is, um, to urge this committee and the school committee and Dr. Bodie to consider, I know it's hard to find the money, but to add what I see as a need is an addition of some sort of tech support. So like if a third grade parent knows their third grader is supposed to be online, but they can't get online or they can't get access to the materials. If there were one or two people standing by to assist those parents, that would be amazing. This is not something the school has, the school, district has needed to provide before. We have IT and we have some tech support within the schools. This is a different kind of tech support. So I know we're not talking about additions to the budget, but to me, this seems like something additional that we would need to spend money on. And I'm just putting it out there as an idea. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, in fact, it, we, we've had two parent forums, secondary and elementary. And in both, in both forums, particularly elementary, this came up as, you know, can't, isn't there someone we can call and, and, and figure this out? And it's, it is a big issue for sure. And I, actually one of the reasons, one of the places I thought you might be going to was the whole issue of technology. We can't share computers anymore in school. And in fact, we're, we know that we can't share any materials. We're gonna have, we're gonna have art bags and they're, re, they're gonna have all of their own materials, pencils, everything in their own bag because we can't share them. And it's like little kind of details. Uh, you know, we're talking today about nurses' desks. You can't have, share the pen with somebody. You know? And this is a whole way of thinking and being that it's just been so foreign to how we've operated. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be definitely, um, it's a huge challenge. But I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, uh, we've talked about this um, in, uh, administratively that we need to really hire somebody but we want to just sort of wait and see and be and be cautious as we proceed in this. Um, but yes, yes, I see the same need. Mm -hmm. Other questions for the superintendent? Okay, I, I just have a couple, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Bodie. Um, how's the status of your other 
reserve funds. And I'm specifically talking about your revolving funds and your special revenue funds. Uh, can they provide you with some uh, leeway if you need it? Um, I guess what I'm asking is what condition are they in? Uh, well, they're in good condition. Mr. Mason's here and he can give you more specific numbers. But one of the things that we were um, able to do uh, through some savings this year, uh, some of that due to savings in special education, um, transportation and uh, some, other, some other things, that um, we are able to, some of, the, some of the positions that would normally come out uh, paid from the reserve because they're enterprise, we've been able to bring some, pay for some of that out of the current operating. So they're in, they're in pretty good shape. I, maybe I'll pull Mr. Mason in on that question, but yes. And that's been something we've been thinking about is we, we, need, we need this cushion because there's gonna be a lot of surprises and things we're gonna need to get um, that is going to be, um, necessary just to be able to function we know that and so yes they're in good shape um mr mason mike michael do you want to just talk a little bit about that yourself yeah i mean i i, I wouldn't go too much into specifics but i would concur and state that our um our our reserve our revolving funds are actually in uh, great standing um and we are actually taking steps this year with um, the, the current fiscal year, with our current status, um, adjusting some expenditures to give us even more flexibility um, in out years in regards to uh, any changes in potential revenues. Um, so an example of this is, you know, um, we are, are intending to um, probably vote uh, to have some funds moved into our special ed reserve funds for future years because we do not know how our circuit breaker revenue uh, will pan out um, in the future years. Uh, we're also looking at even prepayment of, of tuitions and that's even, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have funds that we're going to use from revolving funds, but it actually gives us the flexibility to dedicate some funds that we have this year and, and create an asset so that we can have a, a prepaid asset so that we can use in the future years and give us a if anything unexpected comes we have that flexibility in future budgets okay. um, so hope that answers your questions yes it does thank you any other questions for the superintendent yeah i have a question it's dean dean hi dean so hi so i guess i'm gonna Michael's question kind of confused me. Um, so the town appropriation for the school department is $76 million. Um, the overall school budget is, at least when we had in February, is $83 million. Um, I looked at the gap, those $7 million of non-general fund revenues, and said, thought, this is going to be tight for you guys. Like, this is going to be rough, right? Because like, when I looked at it, I thought to myself, well, you budgeted $500,000 of foreign exchange revenue when there's a travel ban. Um, you, you budgeted, there was another one that stuck out, you know, I mean, athletic fees will be down, but those might, there might be less expenses. Um, you don't know from the state budget how much you're going to get in circuit, circuit breaker reimbursement. I know we have 2.3 million, but that could be cut by the legislature. And then you've got some grants, I think some federal grants and special ed and and things like that. So is it, I mean, maybe Michael, we were just talking about, you were talking about something else, but that, that 7 million isn't really guaranteed. Like you guys could find yourself in a, in a tight situation pretty quickly. Mm. Or no, you think it's fine. No, no, we, we that, that's, we're trying to plan for that. Mike, you might want to join in on this, but no, we know that. Sir, fortunately, a number of years ago, we were able to, um, you know, as you, we, we, we don't spend circuit breaker in the year we get it, it's, it's a year out, so we can't have a chance to plan. But I've heard numbers that could, this could just really sink in terms of what we have. And so 
whatever we're using that money for right now, we're going to have to figure out how we backfill it. Uh, oh, I, I don't think that we, I don't think we think it's rosy by any means. Um, but I think that we're, we're also trying to plan carefully for what we need to be able to with, to do. So the more money we can put in that special ed state um, stabilization account this year, that's going to be that could be the the buffer against a real downturn in circuit breaker. Um, Mike, do you agree on that? Yes, I I do agree on that, and as well as uh, you know, I, I hope I didn't paint that it was rosy in terms of the the the. the the decisions that we're making at the end of this at the end of this fiscal year to to help us in the future um, and that doesn't mean that we're going to have enough in the future we just do not know based on the information but what I can say is that we're we are making certain decisions to try to help those revolving funds to be able to withstand um, and to answer the, some of the questions in terms of you looking at the budget those those are, are revenue sources doesn't necessarily mean that's the revenue we're going to collect in that particular year. Some of that is revenue that we're collecting, but as well as eating into a balance that we've been able to build up. And that's what we were uh, doing, uh, showing in this uh, budget. Uh, so foreign, the foreign tuition has actually been going down in terms of uh, how much we've been collecting, um, but we've been able to adjust some things to have some kind of uh, reserves in case of necessary needs. Um, so that's what we intend to do uh, as we look at our end of year spending and try to make these adjustments to help these balances. So in case that there is any revenue shortfalls, we'll, we'll have to be do as many cuts or, you know, um, have any drastic changes in services. Okay. Okay, is there any other questions? Okay. Um, we'll move on down to Warren articles and use of reserves. I'll handle that. Uh, uh, Dr. Bodie and uh, uh, Mr. Mason, thank you very much uh, for coming. You're welcome to stay if you like, uh, but if you want to head out, that I can understand that. So, well, thank you very much for your help. We really appreciate it. Well, uh, Mike, um, one one question: Can you get me though that those breakdown numbers soon? I need you know the the six numbers that make up the reduced budget. I sent you an email yesterday. I will get that over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Again, thank you. Used to do it. That's fine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let us. Are you voting on this soon, or should we? We should we stick around, or you're? Well, I'm just going to go through the Warren articles and use of reserves, and uh, then throw it open for discussion, and we'll take a vote. So, if you want to hang around, that's fine. If you want to head out, we'll give you a call tomorrow. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The, uh, uh, the rest of it, I, uh, the Warren articles, um, I felt that the Warren article should take some cuts. Um, there's two parts here. If you look at those four articles, uh, one is I looked at anything above $25,000. Um, I wasn't going to go down and start nickel and diming, you know, the, uh, uh, some of these committees. Uh, but I took any of the articles that were optional above 25,000. Uh, arts and culture, uh, I, I hit for 5,000. I've talked about with them. I forwarded in your e their email to you uh, on it because they're, um, they're not going to be putting things out of town day. They're not pay paying for booths. They're not doing a lot of physical things. They're doing a lot of virtual things. And those generally tend to be less costly. The water bodies, uh, you probably remember that uh, all of the, uh, um, they had about 98,000 projected rollover at the end of the next fiscal year. And I think several of you have mentioned that. So uh, I, I think they, they could take a $10,000 hit in their reserves and still do their job for next year. We might have to do some accommodation a couple years down the road, but right now they had plenty of reserves. Uh, I'm not, uh, town day I'm recommending because town day is canceled. So don't need to spend that. And the Harry Barber program, as you're aware, is for uh, senior citizens to come in and work in the town. Uh, I, I've talked with the manager about this and he agreed it's not the climate that you want to bring a lot of senior citizens into the 
town halls to start working and and uh, so I, I think that should be put off until it's safe and uh, uh, Christine Bargiano the uh, head of human services agreed with that so uh, those are the uh, Warren articles uh, are there any questions on those I have a question okay Peter uh, did you talk to anybody in the water bodies uh, committee task group whatever they call themselves yes I I, uh, I sent it to the contact there I think she's a town I can't remember her name uh, but I sent that to her <coughs> um, and uh, she's basically I think said you know we'll get back to you if there's an issue no and I haven't heard and I, I sent those over a week ago week and a half Emily Sullivan I'm sorry is it Emily Sullivan yes yes that's the name uh, so I did. Con I, I contacted everybody uh, that I was looking at. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so all those, uh, and then the use of reserves. So all those reductions by the manager of the school and the Warren articles total about seven hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, we'll have to find out next fall if we're going to have to make more. Uh, and uh, you know, theoretically, if if everything comes up roses, we could put some of it back. We'll have there'll be a special town meeting uh, in the fall uh, on this, but we don't want to go hiring a lot of people and doing a lot of things and then find out we've got to fire them, like the manager said. The use of reserves, uh, I, I, I thought the reserve could take a 10% hit, and this just reduces it back down to about a million five. Um, and I don't think to date we've used any, so I think that's still in pretty good condition. The long term stabilization fund, I think, could take a one year. Uh, hiatus. Um, it, it's about three and a half, 3.6 million, uh, almost 3.7 million uh, in the long term stabilization. Now, the increased use of funds, the overlay surplus, we have been putting about taking about $200,000 a year out of the overlay surplus. Last year, we took about two and a half million, if you remember that. We took two and a half million and put it in the uh, 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 override stabilization fund. Well, there's about another two and a half million, uh, or about two million available uh, that they feel um, could be taken, but that's a little iffy. So, what I recommended to the uh, long-term planning committee and to you is that we take two hundred thousand a year over the next five years. So that'll basically over the five year plan, that'll drain that surplus. But yet on the other hand, if there's a problem, you know, we, we could reduce that amount from 400 uh, to 300 or whatever needs to be done. So uh, those seemed reasonable to me. Uh, to balance the budget uh, is the override stabilization fund of about 2 million and change. Um, so that's what adds it up. Um, if we have a 15 minute, 15% 15 cut in our local aid from the governor's numbers, uh, which the uh, manager feels is, is as reasonable a guess as we can do, we've got a balanced budget at this point. Um, and then as situation clarifies over the summer, uh, we, we can make some additional changes uh, if need to be at the uh, fall. The fall of special is supposed to be focused on the uh, uh, the selectman articles and the redevelopment vote articles, the zoning, uh, but we'll throw an article in to, to modify any budgets uh, or, or use of reserves if we need to. Uh, so are there any, any questions on the, uh, any of it, I guess. Uh, I have a question, John. John, John um, in, in this time of un increased uncertainty, I'm wondering if it's a wise idea to reduce the reserve fund, which is there specifically for addressing uh, issues that uh, aren't anticipated. Well, I, I uh, you know, we built up the reserve fund to, to quite a substantial amount of money. I don't think we've any, we, it's about a million six this year. Uh, we haven't used any. I mean, primarily it was done to build up for snow and ice. Uh, and of course, we didn't have any snow and ice this year. Well, we had some, uh, but there was enough there. So I, I think a million, 
1,556,724 uh, seems adequate to do that. Any other questions, thoughts? Uh, with that, does anybody want to make a motion? Uh, time out. I, I had my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I guess my electronic hand didn't wave hard enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I have some sympathy with John's comments, especially uh, I'm really concerned that the, the altered schedules that the school department is going to be forced into somehow or another, um, it's going to have cost that um, it's going to increase, it's going to increase the demand on, on uh, um, the fiscal, you know, on their fiscal resources uh, substantially <clears throat> because they're going to somehow or another, just think about this, if half the students are online at home, half the students are in the, in the classroom, but the classrooms are all in use, but they just have half of the number of students. Somehow you, you need twice the number of teachers because you have to have people in the classrooms and you have to have teachers taking care of the students that are online. So there, there's going to be some huge cost impact. And, and and probably uh, that's going to have to come out of the reserve fund. I don't know how it gets taken care of, but that's I, I think we're going to see that problem in the fall. Uh, I, I'm not objecting to the, your proposal right now, but I think we should be uh, very aware that there may be a an educational crisis as a result of these um, dramatically adjusted schedules. Yeah. One one question I didn't have a, I didn't remember to ask the superintendent was how many parents are gonna to decide uh, to just go home school and uh, you know, who have the time obviously uh, and, and just bypass the school system altogether. I, I don't know, um, but, but that'll be an interesting factor. I don't think they can legally do that, Al. They still have to register with the school system and talk about what their curriculum plans is. And um, uh, I, I don't know is that necessarily reduces the burden on the school of no. remote learning. Not sure myself, but the, it would still, uh, you know, basically, even though they have to register, take the student out. But um, yeah, all good points. Well, does somebody want to make a motion? I move that we uh, accept these amendments to the fiscal 21 budget. I okay. second it. Second. Okay. Now, is there any further discussion? Okay, I'm going to take a roll call vote now. The vote <coughs> to move uh, and has been seconded for the total changes of 3,246,216. Uh, Grant Gibbion. Aye. Shane Bondell. Aye. John Ellis. Aye. Carolyn White. Aye. Mary Margaret Frank Lamont. Aye. Aye. Uh, Arif Padera. Padaria. Yes. Uh, Jonathan Wallach. Aye. Charlie Foskett. Aye. Uh, Brian Beck is not in. Uh, Peter Howard. Peter? Yes. Uh, Shailene Pokress? Aye. Daryl Harmer? Aye. John Deist? Aye. Alan Jones? Alan? Aye. Okay. Annie LaCourt? Aye. Bill Keller? Aye. Uh, George Kozer? Aye. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And Dave McKenna? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's our business for tonight. Uh, I'd like to, if you could hold on for another minute. Uh, the plan for all this is Alan and I will, uh, primarily Alan, uh, we'll, we'll ship the finance committee report to, out tomorrow. Our plan is to uh, get it to the uh, on the town website and send it out on the town meeting member email list. <coughs>
And uh, so it's made available so people basically can print out their own copies. <laughs> Put on your mask, Al. <laughs> I know I cough a lot. I, I think I'm okay. Your computer's uh, going to get sick. <laughs> I've got a special filter. Um, and the manager's office is willing to print up some hard copy in case people don't, you know, for some reason, don't have a printer, don't have a uh, uh, computer, and they need some copies. So they'll just print them up themselves. So we're not going out to, to print, so to speak. And then we'll send it to all the other officials. Um, I've asked the moderator, he'll send out a consent agenda. So I see the town meeting going through um, the regular budget, the capital budget, Minuteman, CPA, and all other uh, as a consent agenda. So hopefully with that, um, if we don't get bogged down too much in the police budget, uh, you know, we can get through and finish town meeting in an hour and a half. The only two articles the selectmen have are the uh, community development block grant and the uh, revolving funds. Uh, so we'll basically have all of the finance articles done. Um, we're gonna ask the town meeting members to send in questions starting Wednesday. I've still gotta work this out. Um, and so they can be asked and answered uh, to all of the town meeting members. Um, so we'll get as many questions answered way ahead of time or ahead of time. Um, and so we'll have, you know, less of those questions on the high school playing field. Uh, the town meeting is scheduled for June 15th with a rain day of the 17th and the 22nd. We have to dissolve the meeting by the 22nd uh, be because we have a seven day referendum period uh, uh, in order for the town to start spending money. Uh, so to be able to start spending on the July 1st, we have to finish on the 22nd. Hopefully we can finish on the 15th. Uh, everybody understands the sort of special conditions. Um, we'll have no finance committee meeting before the town meeting. Uh, I, I think that would be very difficult. I, all, all the other fields are being ripped up anyway. Now, um, if we finish on the 15th, uh, we'll have a finance committee meeting on the 17th. Now, uh, we'll do all the reserve fund transfers at that time. Uh, and then we'll have election of officers. Um, as I announced last June, I am not a candidate for re-election as chair. So what I'd like to handle it, and I think this would be the easiest and fairest. If you wanna be considered for the chair or the vice chair, because obviously if you elect one of the vice chairs to become one, the chair, that'll create a vacancy for the vice chairs. If you wanna be considered for chair or vice chair, let me know and I will put your name on a list. Uh, if you wanna nominate somebody for chair or vice chair, let me know. I'll check with that person to make sure they wanna serve or be willing to serve. Uh, and then um, I'll put it on the list. So ahead of the 15th, I'll send it out. So you'll know who, who uh, is on the list for election to chair and, and who's on the list election for vice chair. Uh, and, and then we'll take a vote. It's a little different from the way we've usually done, uh, but I think it's the fair to make sure that, uh, you know, if we've got a couple different candidates for vice chair, you know, they both get a shot at it. Uh, and the same for obviously for chair. Um, are, there, are there any questions on that or sort of what's happening over the next two weeks, three weeks? Yes, I have a question. Okay, sure. Um, so in terms of town meeting members being able to ask questions, the town election was postponed until June 6th. Um, it, are, will, we have a, will there be enough turnaround time for new town meeting members to get up to speed? It just seems like a very quick window to me. Um, so I'm just putting it out there for us to think yeah. about like. No, it, it is. Um, and I think that, uh, um, you know, they'll, they'll have to get up to speed. Hopefully they've been trying to get up to speed right along, but we're sort of caught between the, you know, June 22nd is the last day that we could have a town meeting mm -hmm. and you can't hold the arrange to have the meeting on June 22nd when you're having it outside uh, and uh, because it could rain. So we've got to have the, so hopefully people can get up to speed uh, as quickly as possible. And, and I, would uh, just, 
I would just suggest we do the, I guess I'm asking you, Alan, to do what you can to any, certainly there will be some new town meeting members elected. Any new town meeting members that we just communicate that, that it is communicated to them that this is what you're getting up to speed on, this is how you contact the finance committee, et cetera. Okay, I guess actually now that you've made that uh, observation, uh, maybe us, uh, the finance committee can play a role here because we have 21 people serving 21 different precincts. And so I'm assuming that you will know uh, in your own precinct who's a new person. Uh, yep. when, when Alan sends the uh, uh, finance committee to print <coughs> tomorrow, <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, he's also going to send it to all you guys. So mm -hmm. on June 6th, uh, you know, it's probably one or two people, well, maybe more, uh, in your precinct who's going to be new. You could reach out to them and say, here's the finance committee report, and you, you could serve as a mentor uh, if they... Uh, if they have questions and, and reach out to them. So um, I'm always good at turning the, these, uh, these things around back to the uh, individual members. So uh, if you could do that, I think that would be great. I'd be happy to do that for precinct okay. 11. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take care of that in precinct 15. Okay. And I've also been told that there will be a, a budget and revenue task force meeting scheduled, which you know, after the, between the election and town meeting and that's usually a place where all of this stuff is summarized for the entire select board and school committee. And I would encourage new town, all town meeting members to watch that or watch the replays on ACMI because I think it'd be good. It, it capsuled the, uh, the situation. Okay. As far as I know, the, a date hasn't been set for that yet. Yeah, uh, a good suggestion. Usually it's on a Monday before the selectmen's meeting, like at six o'clock. So in that case, it would be the uh, uh, sixth, seventh, the eighth uh, yeah. would probably be the case. Uh, Carolyn? Um, I have a logistics question. So if, when the town meeting happens, should we all be at a specific location a half an hour before it's supposed to start? Uh, no. uh, I think that uh, uh, there's not, that I know of, there are not gonna be any surprises. We're not changing the votes. Uh, it, it's, you know, this is just, um, unfortunately, because of the timing that, that Charlene mentioned uh, and the fact that we have to get the town meeting done, it, it's, it's going to naturally sort of hopefully calm things down. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the finance committee articles go through uh, the consent agenda anyway. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully there won't be a huge amount of discussion on <coughs> things. Um, we're, the finance committee has every report has everything out there, uh, including the changes we've made since March. Uh, so I think we're being as transparent as we can uh, on that. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick question about what it's going to be like at, at town meeting. Are we going to use the clickers and is there going to be a screen or any of that kind of thing? You know, I think, uh, and we're going to have another meeting with, uh, the town council and moderator and all those people uh, to, to talk the details. But my guess is we won't use the clickers because in order to have a clicker, you've got to be able to see it up on a screen. Right. And having a screen outside is going to be really tough. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll go back to sh raising hands. Uh, and uh, I don't think we'll do voice votes because they're just, you know, especially outside, no's tend to dominate. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, all this is up to the moderator, but I, I think we'll go for a show of hands. Also, uh, it's a lot of money to spend for the rental of the clickers for, for an hour and a half right. yeah. or two mm -hmm. hours. So um, it, it makes sense to go back to the old ways. Um, Carolyn? Well, because I'm responsible for it. So, so we're all, everyone on finance is comfortable with the fact that we didn't change any of the reclassifications. And then uh, I'm going to let um, the, the human resources director know that. Okay. Because that, that wasn't yep. on the table. Okay. And uh, Dean, could you call Kathy tomorrow and let her know that we approve the changes? Yes. Okay. And uh, I don't know if Sandy's still here. Doesn't look it. I'll call him tomorrow and let the manager know all those changes. Now, as far as... Uh, uh, officers for next year, you know, I'm not going away. 
for any uh, new chair. I'll be around so I can give as much help as, as people will want, or I can just go in the back row and sit and keep my mouth shut. So uh, that, that, that'll be up to the <laughs> that'll be well, up It's not the bloody likely, I think. No, you don't understand. In the back row, You're keep your mouth chair. open. You get to talk. <laughs> talk. Actually, it, it, it is, make this observation, the chairman really, at least the way I've tried to do it, is sort of less freedom as an individual than a, a, a sort of rank and file member. Absolutely. Because you'll notice I never get up and speak on any other issues before town meeting because mm -hmm. I don't want people to get so ticked off at me that they take it out on the, on the finance committee. So you become chair, you represent the finance committee. That, that's your prime focus. Um, so I'm looking forward to speaking more. <laughs> okay, any other questions or observations? No. Okay, I okay. want to thank, thank you. you all. Uh, you should be getting the full report in the next day or two. Uh, reach out to your precinct people um, and uh, you know, make sure uh, that they've got a report and make sure they know that if they absolutely have to have a hard copy, they can't print themselves to call the manager's office and he'll mail one out to you or you can go pick it up somehow. I'm not sure how you do that actually, but maybe somebody could come out to the side door. Okay, everybody, uh, thank you for all your good work. It's been a crazy, uh, a crazy year. Uh, and uh, I, I'm glad to see everybody is still here and I hope everybody stays safe and uh, we'll see you on the 15th. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.